Hello and good morning. Uh, I'm in conversation with four-time Grand Slam champion Mary Pierce. She needs no introduction. Uh, Mary, what brings you to India? Yes, well, I'm very excited to be back in India, one of my favorite countries, and I'm here to help promote the uh, Junior Wildcard Series by OPPO um, and Roland Garros event. It's an opportunity to give the young tennis players here in India uh, a wild card into the main draw of the uh, Junior Grand Slam Tournament Roland Garros later on this year in, in June and I'm uh, very passionate about it, so I'm very happy to be here. Excellent, and uh, uh, you're wearing Roland Garros yes. t-shirt, and uh, <laughs> I can see that, in, and, and it's a very favorite tennis stadium for you. Yes, definitely, Roland Garros is my favorite tennis tournament of all times, and it's my favorite center court on earth. Um, when I'm out there on that court, I feel basically like I belong there, and it's like my backyard, and it's like being at home for me. You were born in Canada. Yes. Your father was an American. Correct. Your mother was a French. Yes. You could have played for all three countries. Correct. I could have played for Canada. Uh, being born there, my father's uh, country, America. I grew up there until I was 13 and then moved to France uh, when I was 13 years old. And uh, that's when the decision was made uh, by my family that I would represent uh, France. And so I did. I played Fed Cup, won it twice, played the Olympics uh, three times for France in my career. What does the Olympics mean to you? The Olympics means so much to me. It's, um, it's an honor and it's a privilege, first of all, to be able to represent your country and be considered the best athlete in your sport, in your country. And to be there at the opening ceremony is such an incredible experience. And to see all the other athletes from all the other countries in their sports know that they're the best in, in their country as well in the world and what they do. And just to be there um, is, is such an honor and is such a privilege. And I have so many wonderful memories from all of my Olympic Games. Tennis is essentially a very individual sport. Uh, sometimes you have to combat hours and hours of solitude. Mm. It needs a lot of mental strength. Mm -hmm. I think that is exactly where the Olympics are different. You're part of a team, you are part of the Fed Cup team. Yes. Now, if you were to choose between your four Grand Slams, I would more specifically the two Grand Slams that you won yes. at French Open and Australian Open mm -hmm. and an Olympic medal. Yes. Which would be first? Ha! Ah, that's a good question. Um, gosh, I, you know what? I would have to go with my French Open, the, the Roland Garros trophy, because that was my dream in tennis. My dream was to, as a French player, play your home Grand Slam and win your home Grand Slam in front of your crowd, in front of your friends, in front of your family, in your country. And so for me, that was my dream, and my dream came true in 2000. Absolutely. In fact, uh, your mother's name is Yannick. Yes. The most famous <laughs> French men player was also Yannick Noir. Yes. And uh, it's and uh, you two were the last. In fact, you were the last to win a singles mm -hmm. title. On, yes. At Roland Garros. Correct. So, uh, do you feel happy about it, or do you think that French tennis has not moved the way it should have? Well, I'm actually very happy. <laughs> about that and I'm very proud of the fact yeah. that I'm still uh, the last French player to have won the French Open so yes. I'm very proud about that um, of course the country uh, and the French Tennis Federation probably would uh, love to have had another French person win uh, Roland Garros since me it's been 20 years this year is my 20 year anniversary uh, which is incredible I can't believe it's been 20 years already um, but yes I hope I hope in the future that we will have a man and a woman that will win Roland Garros from France. Yeah, I mean, you, when you talk about the next generation, the next generation of tennis players, especially the women's, you still can't find that unique champion after Serena. Mm. Maybe there were times when you won, and then there was, of course, Steffi, and then there was Aransa, uh, there was Martina, then you won. But now if you notice mm -hmm. an Osaka, a Coco, you can't find that consistency among champions. Why is, yes. what, is this a problem? Uh, that, you know, exactly. That's what I was speaking about yesterday is um, you've got so many great players today and it's very exciting. Uh, it's unpredictable. You don't know who's going to win from one week to the next. The tournaments and even the Grand Slams coming up. So, um, you know, there isn't one player yet that has been able to be consistent, like you said, and dominate uh, women's tennis or create a rivalry yet between two players. 
Um, I don't know when we're going to see that. We will see it again in, in tennis, that's for sure, but I don't know when, I don't know who that's going to be yet. Because I'm very sure if this is going to be the trend, we'll never have another Serena Williams. Well, <laughs> Serena Williams is incredible and, and definitely one of a kind and the greatest of all times. And you just have to look at her, her records and, and her titles uh, and it all speaks for themselves. Um, so if things continue, as you said, and you've got different players winning the tournaments and the Grand Slams, each time it's going to be very difficult for a player to come close to doing what Serena's done. Because every time Serena goes to play a tournament or a Grand Slam, you always think that Serena's going to win. Well, she definitely has that ability. Um, she's, the brand equity. She's so strong physically. She's just a whole nother level above everybody else. And she has just got so much power and big serve and big ground strokes. And she's just an incredible competitor. She hates to lose and she wants to win every point really badly. And I've never seen that with any other player, male or female. Uh, she's an incredible competitor. In fact, you talked about strength. That was one of your forte. And yes. I, 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 I was reading an article in the New York Times where Chris Howard said that Mary Pills had the best ground strokes. Hmm. And it was not about the strokes. It was the intensity and your focus to keep the strokes in the court. Wow. Well, that's, uh, that's a great honor to hear Chris Everett say that because that's the player that I looked up to the most, so that really means a lot to me. Um, but I do remember as well, Mary Carrillo was commentating, uh, <laughs> called my type of tennis big babe tennis. Yes, yes. That's and my next question. <laughs> fact, yes. And um, so, yeah, I just, I grew up uh, with my dad always telling me to hit the ball as hard as you can. Don't worry if it goes in or out. One day they'll all go in. So that's how I trained, and I trained hitting the ball as hard as I could. I made a lot of mistakes as a kid growing up, um, but I was very inconsistent. But as I continued to train, I became more and more consistent. The ball started staying more and more in the court, and my power game was my strength. In fact, I also read about you saying that the first day you went to play tennis. Yes. To a coach. Uh, then, then the way we you were hitting the strokes, and he asked you, how long have you been playing tennis? Right. And you said 45 minutes. Yeah. He said, no, 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 not 45 minutes. How long have you been in terms of days or months? How many and years? You, yeah. <laughs> I, I, and you said it was my first day. Yes, exactly. So uh, that's incredible. It is incredible. And um, it just goes to show you that uh, God gave me that gift to play tennis. And that was his plan and his will for my life. I wanted to be a pediatrician. I had another yes. plan, another idea. Yes. Um, but obviously from the first day that I hit a tennis ball, I had been... It was as if I had been playing for years and I could hit the ball and I could hit it in the court and I could play points and serves just like other kids who had been playing for years. You said that you wanted to be a pediatrician but you know mm -hmm. you, you were pulled out of school at a very early age, yes. went to the tennis court. Yeah. Uh, if you were born again, what would you like to be? I wanted to be a pediatrician before you know playing tennis and getting into tennis so and I, even to today, you know, I love everything that has to do with health and wellness and medicine. And uh, my friends, all my closest friends and my family members call me Dr. Pierce. <laughs> oh, yeah, just because of, you know, if they're sick or they're not feeling well or they have an injury, they always ask me like, you know, for advice. What do you think? <laughs> yeah, that, that's because a large part of your life you grew up on your own. Mm. Because, you know, as we said, that tennis is a really solitude sport mm. where you might have your entourage and your coaches and at the end of the day, it depends on you. What has uh, tennis taught you in terms of life? Um, to work hard, uh, many, 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 many things um, beyond time, <laughs> um, integrity, honesty, um, that hard work always pays off. Um, to be organized, to, to come prepared for whatever you have to do, um, to never give up, um, to keep working hard, um, to believe in yourself, um, bouncing back no matter what other people say or, you know, because at one point in my career I think people thought that I was probably done and over with at 30 years yes, old. Yes. Um, but I knew in my heart that I still had great things to do and accomplish and that was one of my best years of my career. And uh, uh, talking about bouncing back, I mean, I also read that you inspired Martina Hingis to make a comeback and how well she did that. <laughs> yeah, that, that was incredible. I was kind of surprised when I heard her say that. Um, but I think because I had injuries and, you know, at one point in my career and I went down to about 300 in the world and I was totally out of shape, 
uh, after a back injury and then I was able to come back, get in shape, be back in the top five and have one of my greatest years um, on tour being 30 years old. Um, you know, for me that's something very special if you can inspire and motivate anybody um, in this world, it's, uh, it's a very powerful thing. And to be able to have done that to one of my colleagues, one of my friends, um, yeah, it's really special. You won a Grand Slam uh, title with her, Martina. Yes. I think the same year you won uh, French Open. Exactly. 2000. Exactly so. So you have a very special bondage with her. Yes, we played doubles for a year and I loved it. Um, you know, Martina and I are still friends today. I've been to her, her wedding um, and uh, this year, yes, it's our 20-year anniversary of winning our doubles title together at Roland Garros. Yes, that's very special. Yes. Uh, uh, Mari, you sp spoke about uh, big babe tennis. Mm -hmm. uh, you, Jennifer Capriati, uh, Conchita Martinez, uh, were the big build players. Mm -hmm. Do you think, and at the same time, you had uh, Martina Hinges, uh, Hannah Justin later, uh, who were shorter mm -hmm. in stature, mm -hmm. but extremely skillful. Mm -hmm. Do you, did you ever think that the size or your build or size mattered when you played tennis? No, well, definitely. Um, you know, there's advantages and disadvantages to everything about being tall and about being short. <laughs> the taller ones aren't the fastest ones. The shorter ones are a bit faster around the court. Um, but if being taller, it helps you with your serve. You know, having a much more bigger and a more powerful serve. And taller as well, you've got longer arms, so you've got you know more momentum in your swing, and you have more power in your shots in general. So um, yeah, I've, I mean, also look at Serena Williams. She's tall, she's taller than me, um, and she's very strong physically. Uh, muscular mass is impressive, and she's super powerful. So it gives you an advantage. Yes, and uh, Mary Pierce could hit. Exactly, on either side of the court. I think mean, that was the best thing about you. <laughs> well, I tried. I think that's what my dad uh, taught me is hit the ball as hard as you can and make them move side to side. How many times can they get the ball if you hit it deep in the corners, hard side to side? Three, four maybe, max. <laughs> yes, yes. Did you ever think that you always had a life as a maybe a beauty queen or a pageant? You could be a sex symbol <laughs> because whatever photographs we saw Mary Pierce at that point in time, mm -hmm. it was just not your tennis. Mm -hmm. There was something wow about Mary Pierce. <laughs> well, I remember doing my first photo shoot, uh, off-court fashion photo shoot when I was 16 years old. And... Um, the photographer came back and he said uh, to my dad, my family, I guess, you know, there's a very famous high-end fashion brand that wants Mary to be their model and do runway yes. shows and yes. things like that. Matt was like, no, my daughter's not a model, she's a tennis player. Right. <laughs> so obviously uh, concentrated uh, on my tennis, um, but I did enjoy, you know, throughout my career doing different photo shoots and things like that. Yeah. Yes, I mean, uh, people always predicted, uh, I mean, showed you in terms not only your tennis, but the way you dressed up mm -hmm. and because you were big and strong. Mm -hmm. uh, so there were other aspects of, you know, uh, being a woman. Mm -hmm. So did you ever think that you could have been a supermodel? No. <laughs> Uh, but I enjoyed it, you know, and I enjoyed also working with Nike and the designers and, um, you know, I enjoyed the fashion side of, of tennis as well and I got a lot of inspiration from Ted Tingling and the dresses that he um, designed for Tracy Austin, um, for Chris Evert. I loved a lot of Chris Evert's uh, dresses when she was playing and I enjoyed, um, you know, helping to design my outfits as well when I was playing. Chris Evert? Chris Evert was the player that I looked up to. Um, definitely the most. I think that um, she was elegant and classy Absolutely. and beautiful, loved her outfits. Mentally, she was just incredible, super strong, never showed anything negative. Her game was so precise and accurate and consistent. And um, yeah, she's my favorite player. You were trained by your dad, mm -hmm. then you had your brother as a coach, then mm -hmm. you had Nick Bolletieri as a coach. Mm -hmm. Where do you see the role of your parents as your trainers? Um, you know, I think it's uh, important to have the support from your family and to have the support of your parents, um, you know, playing playing tennis or whatever it is that you do as a child growing up, um, to have them involved. I think it's a, it's a strength and a force. Um, it's an extra strength, I think, that it gives you. Yeah. 
But you also had difficult times with your parents. Well, with my father. Yeah, my father is my coach um, until I was 18, uh, which was very difficult. Um, he was super, super hard on me. And I basically couldn't wait to be 18. And then I was like, you know, I'm, I'm out of here. So, um, you know, that's when I had Nick Boletari as my coach. And at the time became kind of like a second father to me. Um, and then I was grateful that during my career, um, my brother then also yes, became David. my coach, my brother David. And he traveled with me and he was with me my two best years in 2000 and 2005. Um, but I think what's even greater than that and what's a beautiful um, story is that, that when I was 18 and I left, um, I basically didn't want to see my dad anymore because of how horrible it was and how um, that how hard he was on me that I was I became fearful of him and I hated him basically and um, I think it was about seven years later um, I was able to forgive my father for everything that happened and that our relationship was uh, reconciled and restored and then uh, for the rest of you know the years we had a uh, father-daughter relationship which was really nice. Did he say sorry at any point in time for what he was? He was very extremely hard on you and you didn't have the best relationship with your dad? He did um, in 2017 I believe it was uh, before he passed away hmm. and uh, with bladder cancer so yes. we had some special times together before then. Mari, you are not the only person who had difficult parents or fathers. Jennifer Capriati had, Bern Tomic has. Why does this happen? Steffi Graf had. Mm. Why does this happen? Is it, is it because uh, fathers want to exploit uh, their children for wealth? What is it? Because there have been tax evasion cases and you must have read all this. Mm -hmm. Why does this happen? Why is it that parents, but you also had good parents mm -hmm. like the Serena Williams, the two sisters mm -hmm. and their father. Mm -hmm. They're part of, mm -hmm. he was always there. Yeah. But why do you think this happens in the tennis world? Why tennis world happens elsewhere? But let's talk about tennis. Um, well, I think you have it in everything. <laughs> uh, not only in tennis, but um, I think first of all, it depends on the individual, you know, because not all parents are abusive or crazy. Um, it depends on the individual first. Um, secondly, um, I believe that it can be possible that you know parents can be so hard or abusive or crazy with their with their children and whatever it is that they're doing or in tennis, because uh, there's so much that's riding on it. Maybe because they see it as you know, their ticket to success or their ticket to fame or their ticket to like, okay, this is going to make a lot of money. Mm. And then it becomes like a big pressure and a big stress. And it's like, you have to win and you have to be great and you have to do good. And so by all means, whatever it's going to take and, you know, they're going to be super hard on you and not accept failure and not accept the losses and train you hard to make you great and to make you tough and to make you strong. Um, you know, I think to me, th those are the reasons. It's success, it's money, it's fame. I think that's what drives them and can, you know, make people behave in certain ways maybe that aren't the best or the healthiest. If you were to raise ch children, mm -hmm. like if you had a tennis playing daughter, mm -hmm. what would you tell her? Well, I mean, first of all, I would just introduce her to all sorts of sports and arts and music and whatever you know she wanted to try and if she loved tennis and wanted to play tennis then I would be like okay well that's great and you know mommy can help you if you want and train you or if you want another coach that's also fine and you know I think the most important thing is that uh, you know if I had a child that they would do what they love what they enjoy doing what makes them happy and then I would want to be able to try to support um, you know, my child or that child in, in the best possible way so that um, the child can, can grow and, and, and learn and become, uh, you know, independent in the sense where they're able to, to know who they are, their strengths and weaknesses and problem solve and not be dependent on anybody, um, but just to do what they love, love to do. Having said that, have you thought about raising a family? Yeah, of course. <laughs> 
Uh, I always thought that at 30 years old, I'd you know, get married, have some kids, retire from tennis. Uh, but obviously that didn't happen because at 30 I was still playing and yes. I had one of my hmm. my greatest years. So it hasn't happened yet. Still waiting. Can we can we expect <laughs> that Mary Pierce will have will raise a family? Well, I don't know. I would love that, but you still haven't found the, your man. Well, I, no, I haven't found the man yet. <laughs> <laughs> but there's the fact that I'm 45 years old. Doesn't matter. So, well, that's what age my, for you was never a number. That was what, always a number. That's what my brother says. He says, "No, it's okay. You can still have kids till you're 50." And I was like, "Oh boy, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know about that." But no, I mean, definitely, I would love to. I would love to be married. I would love to have kids. Um, if I couldn't have kids, I would probably adopt as well. But first, have to find the guy. Yes. <laughs> um, 2000 were a very special year for you. You not only won the French Open. Uh, there's aspect of spirituality that you know you were a born again Christian. Yes. Why did you do that? Did you at any stage feel the pressure that that's it? I don't want to play tennis anymore. <laughs> but then you always said that I wanted to bounce back, mm -hmm. and you won 2000 Roller Garros, which was always in your dream title. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I was raised Catholic, and I always, um, you know, believed in God and prayed and would go to church. And I believe that when, as I was getting older and seeing different things in the church, and when I was 18 years old, and uh, as I got older, I started just to see some things for me that, you know, didn't really seem to match up or to make sense. And so I went on this spiritual seeking kind of journey and, uh, you know, read about different religions and different spiritual practices and things like that. And um, I met a girl on uh, the tennis tour from America and I spotted her and I said this girl she's got something special you know she's got something different there's something about her and there was an emptiness in me there was a longing in me for something else in life something more but I didn't know what that was you know despite my success my fame my money everything that I had in life I had everything basically if you looked from the outside and you looked at Mary Pierce in her life you think wow well she's super happy she's got it all she's got the best life but inside I was hurting and I was miserable and I was empty and I was sad and and I just always felt like something was missing and I couldn't put my finger on it and then when I met this player on tour and I saw her I said no she's got something special and we became friends and she started speaking to me about Jesus and who he is and if I have a personal relationship with him and about being born again and these are things that I had never heard of before and when she shared these things with me um, I just knew I just knew that that was the truth and I knew that that was what was missing in my life and it was clear and I was 25 years old and it was in March of 2000 where I was actually in my hotel room all alone and after playing the tournament of Indian Wells and I woke up one morning and that was the morning where I just decided I said, you know what that's it you know I'm just done doing my life this way and I can't continue another day and I just prayed and repented of all of my sins and gave my life to Jesus and that's uh, the moment where my life just totally changed yes. and turned around and I felt such an incredible peace that I had been seeking and longing for, a joy, and I really just felt how much um, you know, the Lord loved me and how He gave His life for me and that's when I was able to forgive my father. Yes, yes, yes. And that that reconciliation with your father. Definitely, it would have been impossible otherwise to forgive my dad. I was never going to forgive him, I was never going to see him again. And um, the Lord showed me that, okay, that I needed to forgive my dad. And I said, Lord, that's, I need help. I need a miracle on that one. So, and I was able to forgive my dad. And what the miracle as well that the Lord did was, <clears throat> excuse me, he, uh, he healed my heart and took away like all of the pain, all of the wounds, everything that I had been through in my life was just healed and taken away like it had never happened. Like it wasn't even me, it was another lifetime for someone else. And I was able to love my dad again and have a relationship with him. Religion is a very controversial subject. <clears throat> In fact, across the world, if you notice, uh, we, people are being taught to hate, kill. Religion has been used all for the wrong purposes. In, as we speak, is being, is, this is the case in India right now. What does religion mean to you? It is, it is to unify or to divide. Why is there so much of uh, politics of hatred around religion? Mm -hmm. Religion for me is man-made. Um, unfortunately, religion has divided people, and I don't believe in religion. I believe that there is one God, and He's created us all 
to love him and to serve him and to love one another and to serve one another. And um, that's what I believe in. I believe as the Bible to be the truth and the word of God. And that's um, what, I, what I choose to believe in. And for me, it's all about a relationship. It's not about a religion and it's, it's um, spiritual and it's a choice. It's a personal choice and it's my conviction. That's what I believe. Now you sad that there's so much of hatred in the world now? Uh, well, of course. I mean, who, who wouldn't be sad, you know, to see human beings, you know, being mean to one another and hurting one another. Um, that's definitely not the plan of God and that's not how we're called to live and to be towards one another. Thank you, Mary, for your time, spending time for Outlook. And pleasure it's to pleasure. have you back in India and we wish to see you more here often. Thank because you. Because this is the place where all the spirituality <laughs> of the world lies. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to Thank be you, here. Mary. Thank you. God bless Grateful. you. Thank you. Thank you.